I know you've been a member of the Overbrook reading group. How did you get involved with that? Who has been in the group? And how has that influenced your writing? It's a funny story. This is a psychiatrist called me up. And she said, I am an amateur poet. And your name was on a list. And I would like to get a group of poets together to have a poetry discussion, a poetry criticism. So we said, fine. And I showed up. And a guy named Peter Kroc showed up, didn't know him before, this is 1983. Mm -hmm. And a Russian lady named Valentina Sienkiewicz showed up. And an artist poet named Janet Sadler showed up. And uh, we started this group, <laughs> and we were enjoying one another's poetry, but very quickly we came to realize the psychiatrists couldn't write poetry. <laughs> at all, and we were so embarrassed because we four were really having a great time and there was this fifth wheel. So as fate will have it at times, this woman had a gigantic car accident, broke bones, was laid up for months and called us and apologized and said, I can't have our poetry group anymore. We all smiled at one another and we started <laughs> having our own group moving to one another's house every month. Well, here we are 35 years later, and Pete and I are still in it. Janet went off to pursue art more than poetry, and Valentina was into so many things. Ironically, she knew my wife at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Library, and uh, she has an interesting career, had an interesting career too. She loves animals. Uh, she got involved with Save the Animals movement, and she retired from the group. Um, she ran the only all-Russian magazine in America called Strechi, which means the search or something like that. And she knew all the major Russian poets. She was wonderful. We were sorry to lose her, but she had to go. And as, we, uh, as the years went on, Pete and I carefully accumulated some people, some of whom were good, some of whom were not so good, but they seemed to through attrition fall away. And those who really wanted to stay did stay. So we have something like 12 or 13 strong now with people like Robert Zoller and Tree Reasoner and Lisa Barron and Bill Van Buskirk, all coming with different careers in poetry. And what we do is we have fabulous dinners because Ferris de Sholivar is Persian. Her food is great. Uh, Kasia Newcomer is Polish, has great Polish food. And uh, we had Russian food with Valentina, so we had all these, we even had a Haitian poet for a while who had Haitian food. So we were having a marvelous time. We'd eat for a long while, and then we'd remember we were supposed to do poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so sort the of food like, came first, yeah. and the poetry <laughs> came second. That's right. <laughs> so it's been very, the cross currents have been wonderful. It's been very rich and very stimulating. It just keeps us going, because we know every month we have to have a poem that will be interesting enough that the group can devour it and still have something left. Do you think being part of that group, did that make any changes to your writing style? I wouldn't say that. I think it mostly just uh, reinforced everybody's love of poetry and we became family. I mean, my kids were very young and kind of grew up with Pete Crock's kids. So they've known each other for over 30 years. That kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And when you've eaten a, a, a certain local food, you come to appreciate that culture that much more. So we've learned a lot about each other, but very much in a familial way. Your poetry, how much do you think it's, has it changed over the, over the years? Or hasn't it? Are you, do you use like the same sort of poetic devices? Do you kind of have the general themes, subject matter? I'd say yes to all of them and then add some. Yes, that's true, but as time goes on. I think I'm the kind of poet who loves variety. I could write a poem about a bicycle, and the next poem would be about a battle in World War II. And then maybe the third one would be a love affair that went wrong. So I love the variety. I don't stay hooked on one topic too long. In your, the class that you teach, you, you very much focus on uh, other people's poetry, both contemporary and classical. Does that put your own poetry in a different perspective? Does it make you feel differently about what you yourself are writing? I think 
as poets, unconsciously, we're always being influenced in some way or another. I think when I first started to write poetry, the two biggest influences I had were a very different pair of guys, Robert Frost and T.S. Eliot. They were my two gods. I loved Frost because of his nature poetry, mm -hmm. but I especially liked his blank verse, where he didn't have to rely on rhyme, because his blank verse is narrative, strong narrative. I mean, there are wonderful poems, some we know like Death of the Hired Man, West Running Brook, which is a very philosophical piece, The Witch of Coas, which is a, a ghost story. And Frost was very good at telling these stories. You know, we're talking about 10 syllables to every line, and he uses wonderful enjambment, like if he has uh, a sentence broken, and it's like two pieces to one sentence, two or three syllables on one line. He's got the other six or seven on the next line to balance it out. You always count 10. I mean, he's really a perfectionist when it comes to structure. That's what I like about him. I love T.S. Eliot because of his vivid imagery. And he's very clear in his images, too. He doesn't use a lot of adjectives or adverbs to weigh his poetry down. And sometimes he'll rhyme when he wants to, and sometimes he won't. I like that idea, too. You know, where we think it's, oh, I want to really highlight these two words, so I'll set up a rhyme for them. So maybe those things have influenced me over the years. And I guess that, you know, these influences can be direct or indirect, or indirect. as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm starting my seventh year of teaching this course, and I'm really stretched every year to find new voices. And certain people I thought, oh, I can't handle this, or I don't like this. I've tried, and it's opened me up, too. And I hope that's been reflected in my class. Let me just speak about Ali at Temple University. It's the greatest experience I've ever had teaching poetry, because they're all grown-ups. They're 50 years old or older. They are all there because they love poetry. Can you imagine that? A class of 12 or 15 people who all love poetry? How can you go wrong? And their wealth of experience. They've lived life. So they know if a poet is phony or not. They, they can smell the phoniness. And they could also appreciate a new, fresh voice. And that's what I'm looking for. I've also started to look more and more as those years went on at prose, we talked about essay writing and short stories, prose that are poetic. And there's a heck of a lot of prose that's like that out there. Think of uh, Virginia Woolf. You could pull parts of her essays that read like poetry. Cannery Row by John Steinbeck is a novel, or maybe loosely connected short stories. But they're so poetic. They're just wonderful. And again, he's the guy who has simple language, like Eliot. I'm not talking about the Wasteland and four quartets where you need footnotes. I like the earlier Eliot. I like the Preludes. I like the Hollow Man. I like J. Alfred Prufrock. I think they're very approachable poems. Would you say prose is the closest type of writing to poetry? How about song lyrics? Where do they come in? It's tough to look at, at song lyrics without the music. Yes. Because there they are, bare ass naked. And you say, okay, now does this make a good poem? And a lot of these great songs go by the wayside because they're trite. It's the music that makes them. So I really qualify song lyrics as, as poetry, especially as good poetry. But there are some essays that are so colorful, it's like prose poetry. A guy like uh, Barry Lopez, who writes about nature and has won a lot of awards. Some of his essays are prose poetry, right through from the beginning to the end. And that's what we handled in the course. I'm sure some of my students say, what are we going to do? Look at this essay? This is a poetry course. And then they suddenly realize how much poetry is embedded in the prose. Do you still dabble with essays? Do you still write? Oh, them? yeah, more than ever. I've been retired for seven years and I've written more in the last seven years than I did 17 years teaching <laughs> school because I didn't have time. I couldn't focus and have quiet time. I was marking papers all the time. I wrote a, a, a book review of Dylan Thomas's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Dog. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. Poetry is wonderful in those short stories. And the society published me. 
I think John Updike's best novel was one of his earliest one, Poor House Fair. And I wrote a review of that, and the John Updike Society published it. So I'm very, very pleased about that. And you don't have any problems jumping from one genre to the other? They don't, don't seem to. sort of collide? Don't seem to. Uh, once I've read a book that I feel is filled with poetry, I'll go back and start marking it to find those uh, passages. Here's another thing. I don't write a review as a know-it-all. Like, I think a lot of critics have a view, a literary view of the world, right? And they're going to imp impose that on anything they review. I'm not like that at all. I'm trying to sell the book. I want people to read the book. But from my angle, I want them to read it for the poetry in it. So I step back. Uh, if you read one of my reviews, it's loaded with quotes by the guy I'm reviewing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way it should be. Ladies and gentlemen, here is John Updike. Here is Dylan Thomas. And I step back in the wings as a, wings as a very humble MC and let them do their thing. Just like Steve is doing with you today. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>